So welcome to the uh, first alternative lecture series back for semester two. We're really pleased to be able to put on the alternative lecture series again. Uh, sadly, with the weather, we're not able to do it in person, uh, but we're really pleased that we can do it online. And we're really grateful to Iptisam Ahmed, uh, who's the head of policy and research at the LGBT Foundation at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to dip out now and let Iptisam do the speech. Hello, thank you so very much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Please pardon me if I'm a little bit fidgety. I've got a slightly clingy feline um, um, wandering around the house, but hopefully that shouldn't be too much of a problem. If I do end up getting disconnected, you can blame him for chewing through the wire. Um, I'm so delighted to be speaking uh, at the alternative lecture series, particularly for LGBT History Month. It is such an exciting time. Um, the theme for this year's LGBT History Month is politics and art. And I think that is such a fantastic, um, that is such a fantastic um, theme to go with. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide. Um, thank you. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is power, politics and art, a look back at LGBTQ plus history through arts and culture. Um, you do have my email address here um, if you feel like you would like to reach out um, after this for any reasons. It's iptasam.ahmed at lgbt.foundation. And the phone number at the very bottom of the screen, which you will see in every slide, is uh, just as a reminder, it's the phone number for our um, contact and for our helpline. Um, so if anyone feels that they need any support at any time, that would be the number to contact. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the theme for this year's LGBT History Month, as I mentioned, is politics and art. Um, I am very excited for this uh, as the theme. It is such a crucial reminder that arts and culture have always been political. Um, you'll often hear, um, folks say, well, my art isn't, or what I write is apolitical, and my characters don't have an agenda. Um, my response to that is always um, every aspect of personal life is political because the politics is how um, our personal lives are impacted on a day-to-day -day basis. So if someone um, says that their work is apolitical, what they're really saying is that their work is speaking to the status quo. Their their work isn't engaging with minoritized voices or marginalized politics, and that's fine. Um, some some of the most entertaining pieces of work are like that. But I reject the idea that arts and culture can be apolitical in any way. Um, because to say you're apolitical is to say you're fine with things the way uh, with things the way they are. Um, so what I'll be doing for the rest of this uh, lecture is I'll just be going through different periods of history and kind of reflecting on the types of art that it has created. Um, I'm mostly focusing from the perspective of um, kind of a Euro-Western white society. Um, and the reason I say that is simply because the laws around LGBTQ plus visibility and criminalization are very different in different parts of the world. So you would probably need um, an entire module if you want to cover that in, in, in exact detail um, and definitely ask your universities to, to have that kind of module. Um, but I will be touching on um, representations from different parts of the world. So it's, it's kind of keeping it centrally focused on what it's like, you know, in, in the UK and the West broadly, but then also touching on a few other examples. And what I want to um, kind of reflect on through the course of it, and what would be really great for people watching this to reflect on through the course of it is just a few of the points I've, I've noted here. So what has visible representation looked like over time? How does um, different laws, different kind of social norms, different expectations, how has all of that impacted the visibility of representation? 
um, something else is kind of actively political representation. So where um, the visibility of a piece of work being LGBTQ plus is very intentional, it is making a specific point versus something that's slightly more passively political. So um, it, it's either may, uh, it could be that the LGBTQ plus aspect of it is just one aspect of many things. It could just be that they're not trying to make a specific point around LGBTQ plus politics or representation, but by having that representation there, there's still that impact. It's also important to remember kind of the politics of good representation versus representation for the sake of it. And what I mean by that is you'll see lots of examples of particularly early um, LGBTQ plus representation where um, the visibility isn't very nuanced, um, the, the types of conversations are really one dimensional, um, the actual community concerns are often not being engaged with. And as representation evolves, the expectation then is that may be where you start and it's okay for that to be the starting point, but that can't be the end point. So, you know, you don't, oh, I, I have a, I have a, someone on this screen who's LGBTQ plus tick. That's not the end, that's not the end all and be all. Um, and the final point uh, that I would love for folks to reflect on is kind of where this representation is about LGBTQ plus lives almost being um, assimilated and kind of taken into the base standard of representation versus understanding the diversity and the richness of LGBTQ plus lives and how that can be quite different. Um, and again, pros and cons to both um, specific reasons for one or the other. Um, so just think about it as we go through the examples. Um, so um, we'll just dive straight in. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I think of this slide says, we have always been here and queer. Um, just a side note, I will sometimes use the word queer. Um, I appreciate that that uh, is a word that has a bit of a contested history and um, there are points of conversation where perhaps um, it has been used as a slur in the past. Um, I view it as a word that is being reclaimed by the community. Um, and while I would never say that as a word that should be used to identify someone who doesn't want to be identified as queer, uh, in and of itself, the word isn't um, as, the word isn't derogatory as far as I'm concerned, but it, it's um, being reclaimed. So I do want to put that out there as we continue. Um, so this slide kind of offers a few different examples of pieces of art um, from across the world, which um, really challenges the idea that LGBTQ plus identity and LGBTQ plus representation is some sort of modern, socially and politically correct woke agenda. Um, so if you look at the um, top left of the slide, you see uh, piece of Greek art, which is Achilles and Patroclus. Um, unlike the 2004 film Troy, uh, which is inaccurate on so many levels, Achilles and Patroclus have always been seen in antiquity and in the classics as characters whom we in the modern age would define as queer. And just as a reminder, these kinds of modern definitions don't apply across history as well. Um, love and intimacy and romance and um you know even even sexual intimacy weren't defined in such rigid ways so so achilles and patroclus are in in many um representations actually lovers um and if you don't necessarily believe that i encourage you to think about the way achilles actually mourns patroclus's death in the iliad um, you don't do that for a roommate, um, is, is kind of the joke among classicists. Um, the image uh, in the top center is a, is a temple image uh, from a Hindu temple in India. It's actually quite a famous temple image because that particular uh, vision is present in quite a lot of temples. And 
that's also quite important because there is often a misconception that um, Asian communities and South Asian communities are overtly, traditionally overtly conservative and um, we don't talk about sex. And in, in many ways, in, in many parts of modern society, we don't. But the reality is our traditions have always been quite um, openly um, sensual. Um, and if you look at the image in, in question, it's showing a group of women engaging in sexual acts together. Um, and again, it's an important reminder of what um, histories used to look like before it became criminalized. And in the case of India, it became criminalized under colonialism. Um, the image just below that is a group of um, Egyptian boys um, roughhousing on a piece of wall art. Um, and again, it's that same representation of a reminder that intimacy and intimacy between people of the same gender have always actually been quite normal and normalized and, and has existed for centuries. Um, and what's really important about that particular image is that there have been a lot of conversations in Egyptology circles and um, Egyptian history circles about reevaluating a lot of classic art um, because there have actually been quite a few representations of uh, people of the same gender being shown in um, what was interpreted as platonically kind poses. But actually, if you look at the history of intimacy, um, they were in love. Uh, or they were in lust as well in some cases. And this is actually a really good example of kind of how it was quite broadly accepted. Um, the image on the very right is a very interesting one. It is a Mesopotamian um, temple image that's been restored. Um, and although it's a bit hard to see in, in this particular slide, what it's actually showing is a deity who um, defies various gender norms and um, would be seen in modern terminology as potentially gender fluid and potentially also intersex. Um, a lot of classic deities and a lot of classic mythologies are based on um, gods and goddesses um, who are, who, who, who kind of traverse and transcend uh, gender boundaries. And why that's really important to understand is it kind of reasserts this idea that what we now think of as queerness, what we now think of as LGBTQ plus identity, has always been considered as divine and therefore um, almost aspirational and accepted. And I think that's a really important point to raise. Um, the image at the bottom left, so the one just below the Greek pottery image of Achilles and Patroclus is a modern um, image. It was drawn in, it was painted in 1960, but it's based on a, a set of frescoes that were found in the ruins of Pompeii. Um, the reason I included this image rather than the original is because the original Pompeii images are very hard to find in their restored um, position. So I do want to flag that this is not the original piece of antiquity. But again, Pompeii um, has representations of a lot of um, different types of intimacy uh, between genders, within genders, across genders. Um, and again, a really good reminder of, of what classics and classical uh, acceptance is. And the reason that's so important today is you'll hear a lot of um, conversations, particularly from a um, almost a neo-colonial, uber conservative, uh, uber um, white supremacist perspective of kind of, oh, the, the ancient civilizations knew what they were doing and we've lost the golden age. But the reality is that ancient civilizations have actually been quite queer. So I suppose we have lost the golden age because we've lost that level of LGBTQ plus acceptance. But it's a good reminder of where human history perhaps used to be when there weren't rigid definitions and particularly rigid criminalization, which brings me to the next slide. Um, criminalization, um, of course, varies from country to country and varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. 
Um, but the broad strand of it has basically been this idea that um, particularly due to forms of religious morality and in the West that was down to Christian morality, or I should say a particular interpretation of Christian morality, um, because Christianity can be quite queer as well. Um, it came down to this idea that actions are unacceptable and therefore identities that normalize those actions are unacceptable. Um, so what we see in these images are kind of the the, um, the enforcement of, of different types of criminalization and the way art um, and symbolism kind of created subversive ways of representation. Um, so I'm not going over these in chronological order, but I will actually start in the middle, which is uh, the, the central black and white image, which is of Oscar Wilde and his lover, Bozy. Um, Oscar Wilde is, one might even say, infamous for the um, gross indecency trial that ended up um, leading to him being imprisoned. And he is um, a really, you know, an, an absolutely famous um, uh, writer. And if you actually go back and properly read his texts, they're very overtly queer. Um, they're quite subversive. Um, anyone who reads The Portrait of Dorian Gray and doesn't see that as an analogy for kind of queer dual identity is, is missing one of the big points of that book. Um, but his was actually quite an important trial because um, there was a, an, an aspect of tacit acceptance where as long as you weren't being indecent in public, as long as you weren't flaunting your sexuality, in many of these jurisdictions, it would pe people would be okay to look the other way, particularly if you were rich um, and privileged. And you actually see that in a lot of modern countries where homosexuality is criminalized. Um, you don't actually get a lot of cases of people being taken to trial, even if they may be known publicly as someone who's homosexual, because you deny the act. And actually his trial, although it was based on um, kind of a, a, a bad piece of egotistical advice, um, it was quite an important moment because it did represent a point at which um, you were making a legal argument for, um, for normalization. Of course, in, in his particular instance, it was a denial of being called a sodomite. Um, this character assassination and libel but the the legal legacy of that in many ways is kind of um arguing for the normalization of identity versus the criminalization of an act and you'd see that much much later on in legal cases in the us around the machine society in the 50s um, all the way down to current decriminalization arguments in countries in the commonwealth so you stop seeing it as an act you see it more as an identity and a lived experience um, but even amidst all of those conversations, you saw increased oppression and persecution. Um, the image on the very left of the slide is the hanky code, which was a way where um, mostly gay men um, were able to subtly indicate that they were part of a community by um, folding different colored handkerchiefs in different ways in their back pocket. I am not an expert on the hanky code. I don't actually know what each of those colors and folds represent. But what it basically was is a subtle way of giving a nod towards a community and um, potentially even finding someone like-minded, finding someone to love, finding someone to make friends with, finding community underground. Um, and speaking of community underground, what you see on the image on the very right of the screen um, is a representation of the pansy craze, uh, which took off um, in the US and also in the UK in ranging from the 1920s all the way to the 1950s. This image is from the um, late 20s in New York. And the pansy craze was kind of reasserting this idea of you've criminalized my sex life, you've criminalized the act of um, homosexual intimacy, but cross-dressing is legal, 
dressing flamboyantly is legal. Um, and what you ended up seeing through the pansy craze was actually a lot of attempts by um, authorities to try and stamp down on, the, on what they called subversive and immoral behavior. And it was a really powerful way to kind of go, um, the letter of the law is saying one thing, but your bigotry is saying another. Um, it was also the beginnings of what we now see as drag scenes and cabaret scenes and the queer nightlife. So it was kind of a, a, um, a two-pronged contribution to queer liberation and queer rights. Um, the last image on this slide that I want to focus on is the upside down pink triangle. Um, now this um, was of course a symbol that was used in um, Nazi concentration camps. Um, I will not be going into details of, of the conditions there, so please don't worry. But that said, if you do feel like you need to step out of the stream, it's totally understandable. Um, but the reason that symbol actually became quite powerful in many ways is because of how it got reclaimed. Um, so after World War II, um, many, particularly many homosexual men, but also many lesbians who had the pink triangle on their um, on their camp uniforms were re-imprisoned after World War II. Um, not many people know this, but paragraph 157 of the German Penal Code kept homosexuality illegal after World War II. So um, they were one of the few demographics whose um, legal uh, persecution continued after World War II. And the triangle, therefore, became actually quite a powerful symbol of reclamation. Um, you'll actually see many spaces use the pink triangle now to proudly claim queerness because it was this idea of resilience and it was this idea of um, bringing justice for ourselves rather than relying on the outside. And I don't want to romanticize what happened. I do want to make it very clear that in all of these cases, uh, these were horrific scenarios that people had to live through and in many cases didn't live through. They didn't make it out the other end. So don't want to make it seem like this was all romantic and, oh, look how wonderful these symbols are. What I want to try and drive home is how necessary dissent was and how necessary dissent continues to be. So we go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we now see in this particular slide is the evolution of kind of queer art specifically as a form of protest. Um, so over the decades, um, homosexuality and, and same gender intimacy became decriminalized. Um, in some countries, including the UK, we now also have um, same gender marriage. But that doesn't, but, but that doesn't erase the fact that there is ongoing persecution um, in, in some cases still legally in these jurisdictions. So in the UK, for example, there is an extreme amount of transphobia and legal transphobia and social transphobia. But there's also social queerphobia broadly. Um, the image on the very left and the image at the bottom that says ignorance equals fear, silence equals death, um, those are both pieces of work um, by Keith Haring, who was an extraordinary queer artist in the US. Um, and his work was very much based on the idea that um, he, he used kind of very simple 2D shapes to, to um, reflect on queer liberation and queer histories. The two images here are particularly responses to the HIV AIDS crisis in the US. Um, at the time of the crisis, again, as a reminder, by this point, homosexuality was not um, criminalized at the same extent. It was still criminal in many states, but um, in, in many cases, it was reduced to fines rather than imprisonment. Uh, there were more questions around consent, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was kind of, th these two pieces of art really drove home the fact that um, you've now legalized or decriminalized a lot of identities, but you're still too afraid to talk about them. It's still taboo. And that's where the HIV AIDS crisis, while it isn't exclusive to the LGBTQ plus community, 
uh, it never was, it never has been, uh, and it isn't today. That's why it had such a massive impact on minoritized communities, uh, because there was an, an expectation that these communities couldn't talk openly about healthcare, couldn't talk openly about sex ed, couldn't talk openly about community needs. So it was really about driving that home. Uh, and again, you see in, in particularly, in, in particularly visible in the left-hand image, but also in the one in the bottom, the uh, pink triangle being reclaimed. The image at the top is a clutch that was um, carried by Laverne Cox to an awards show. I do forget the year, I apologize, but this was um, specifically referencing a a court case that was going in front of the US Supreme Court that would be challenging trans rights, um, particularly around access to public spaces like bathrooms. Um, Laverne Cox is proudly and openly trans, uh, she's proudly and openly black. Um, and she talks about um, a lot of her activism through her art. So what you see here is um, a pretty simple um, accessory at an event that wasn't really political in the traditional sense of the word, but it got people talking, it got a lot of conversations going, um, and ultimately um, the court case was resolved in favor of trans rights, uh, which isn't to say that being uh, part of the trans community is any easier in the US, there's still so many challenges, but this was actually a really interesting piece of protest art because it got a lot of people talking and got a lot of people writing to their senators and their congresspeople. Uh, the image of the very right kind of really encapsulates what protest can do for the community. Um, the fist is a traditional black power symbol. Um, and of course the, um, the painting brush is a really nice touch about the arts and you see the traditional rainbow flag on it. But what you see there is this idea that you can have multiple forms of identity. So black liberation, people of color liberation, but also queer black and queer people of color liberation through arts and practice and culture. And I think it's a really powerful reminder for those of us in the community who might have some levels of privilege that um, the fight isn't over, some parts of the fight maybe, but we still need to uplift and stand up for voices um, who are still fighting. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, Pride parades are a fantastic space of public art. Um, it, every, every single participant at a Pride parade is, in my opinion, a, a walking piece of art. Um, the images here, uh, the image on the uh, very left is from um, uh, from New York Pride a few years ago. You see the, the gigantic Pride flag when it was kind of again that reminder of um, what community can do when they come together. The image in the bottom center is from uh, Black Pride in the UK. So a space to particularly uplift queer voices of color. Um, and it's a really important reminder again of how different identities intersect and how different identities um, exist at the same time. Um, and the image on the very right is from Bangladesh. Uh, there was a rainbow rally. Bangladesh is still one of the countries where it's illegal to be gay. Um, and um, what this particular image represents is kind of co-opting more mainstream platforms of art to represent um, queer rights. Uh, Bangladesh annually has a, a, a New Year's parade, which is a space to celebrate culture and traditions and local art. So um, a lot of members of the queer community got together and, and wore um, saris and traditional clothing and traditional costumes in the colors of the rainbow. Um, so if they were called out on it, they could disperse um, without being harassed but at the same time it was kind of reminding folks that queer history is part of Bangladeshi history and Bengali history. So what we see here is kind of different parts of communities uh, putting themselves forward and reclaiming some of that, um, reclaiming some of that space through public art. I do, if you could go to the next slide please, um, Pride flags, I think are re it's a really good point to just really quickly touch on them. Um, you would have seen, of course, what is now the traditional six-striped flag, 
Um, what some folks may not be aware of is that the original Pride flag was actually eight stripes, which is the one at the top left. It was designed by an artist's collective, which included Gilbert Baker. Each of the stripes stands for a different um, aspect. So pink was sexuality, red is life, orange is healing, yellow is sunshine, green is nature. Cyan was um, magic or art, indigo was serenity, and purple was spirit. Um, due to printing and uh, dyeing costs, the pink stripe was removed and then the cyan stripe got um, merged with the indigo stripe to turn into a blue stripe, but that was the original flag. And again, it's a reminder of a very visible sign of um, a very visible sign of kind of um, community building. Um, another pride flag that you are very likely to see is the trans pride flag, uh, bottom, uh, bottom left. Um, where the baby blue and, and the pastel pink represent kind of the traditional notions of masculinity and femininity, and the white stripe in the middle is inclusive of non-binary identities. Pride flags are a great way to connect. They're a great way to show support um, and acceptance and inclusivity, which actually brings us to progress pride flags, because um, something that's really important to recognize is that the community still faces very specific issues. Um, a lot of people mistakenly think that progress pride flags are about division and setting people apart and trying to imply that some parts of the community are better than others. Uh, my take on it is progress pride flags are flags whose ultimate goal is to become obsolete because what they are really about is showing and highlighting struggles that the community is facing um, and really uplifting those voices. The traditional Western progress flag is the one on the top right. So in addition to the six stripes of the rainbow pride flag, you have the black and brown chevrons, which represent people of color. You have the blue, pink and white chevrons for the trans pride flag. And you now also have the yellow triangle with the purple circle in the middle, which is the intersex pride flag. But it's also important to remember that pride flags vary from context to context. So the progress pride flag below that in this slide is a progress flag, flag that's used in India. It doesn't make sense in a majority brown country to have a specific black and brown chevron to talk about racism. But a huge issue in India at the moment is caste. So instead of the progress flag chevrons in, are used in the West, you have the black, blue, and red chevrons, which are the colors of the self-respect movement, which are about challenging caste and, and uh, making sure that there's caste equality and justice. So a reminder for folks that progress flags and pride flags vary from context to context. It's about representing and visually showing what different communities and challenges are. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're nearing the end, so we will get to questions in a moment, but I do think it would be remiss to not touch on the joy and campness of fashion. Uh, if anyone's ever read Susan, Susan Sontag's essay, um, Notes on Camp, um, it's a wonderful reminder of how clothing is part of how we identify with each other. It shows our comfort levels, but it also shows our connections to other parts of the community and to other people. Um, and just as a brief overview of the images I've chosen here, um, top left is Janelle Monet attending the Met Gala a few years ago on camp. Um, it was a piece that was kind of inspired by the um, chaos and beauty of queer revolution and queer culture and uh, things like drag and, and dandies. Um, the image top center is Billy Porter attending the same event. He um, was making a statement about the normalization and acceptance of black queer identities in the past. So he dressed up as an Egyptian deity. Um, so to kind of reflect both opulence and royalty, but also re a reminder of histories. Um, and the image at the top right is Lil Nas X recently at the BET Awards in 2021. Um, his whole point was, you know, men can wear dresses too. <laughs> and um, dresses can be elaborate and um, 
you know, it, it can tell a story and can be quite eloquent, but it can also be quite masculine, which is why he's showing off his collarbone and his chest. Um, so really driving home the idea of clothes that aren't gendered. Uh, the two images at the bottom. Bottom left is uh, Ollie Alexander from years and years, um, wearing a handmade um, kind of ripped apart rainbow jacket. Um, the jacket is part of the collection of Queer Britain, which is the UK's first ever LGBTQ plus museum, which is going to be opening its doors in London this summer. Um, and um, the, the statement he was making, he said, was on the one hand, it was just a fun jacket to wear and I liked the colours, but it was also kind of representing things like the fragmentation of the community, but also the the grassroots fact of we, we, we bring ourselves up. And of course, there's Sasha Velour, who is the image in the bottom right, uh, winner of Drag Race season nine in the US and a really famous drag artist. Um, whose um, costume head to toe is um, paying homage to um, Basquiat, um, a black queer artist from New York, whose work has often been considered too extreme and too severe. Um, I should say, I shouldn't say often, historically was considered too extreme and too severe, but is actually kind of being reclaimed and re-celebrated. Um, can we get the next slide, please? So we're down to the last two slides for art um, before I open up to questions. Um, and in addition to kind of these political statements is quite overt, it's also really important to recognize that mainstream arts are quite important as well. So here we're going to the idea of um, LGBTQ plus representation is quite normal. Um, and I've picked images from a few different contexts and cultures to really drive that home. Um, so the image top left, which is uh, just says love is love at the very top. That's from a recent Marvel Comics, um, a, a recent Marvel Comics issue uh, called Marvel's Voices Pride. Um, it shows a lot of major uh, Marvel Comics characters who are LGBTQ plus attending a Pride celebration. Um, and again, in this particular instance, it's just about having fun and being visible. Um, see if you can spot any of your favorite heroes, by the way. <laughs> the image on the bottom left is just a few posters from Bollywood in India showing um, LGBTQ plus cinema, which used to be kind of subversive and considered indie and art house. Um, now in the mainstream, and I'll be honest, some of it is atrociously cheesy and some of it is really really lovely and wholesome and uplifting um but it's again just a reminder of um the celebratory part of art um and all of these films came out shortly after um, um same gender intimacy was decriminalized in india um and the comic strip at the top right is um from Bangladesh. It's a comic strip called Thi, which is uh, about the life of a young lesbian girl in Bangladesh. Um, the story is very much about basically reminding folks that lesbians are the, you know, they have the same experiences as any other woman in many ways. So it's kind of, you know, her having crushes, her stressing out about her makeup, her wanting to go cycling in a storm, um, her mother telling her that she's too old for a teddy bear. So it's really just about her being a lesbian has nothing to do with a lot of her day-to-day -day life and it's kind of normalizing that. And the final image is um, a recent New Year's uh, poster from China. Um, so kind of, again, showing a lot of same gender intimacy, which brings me to the final slide. Um, what we've kind of seen through this is the fact that queer histories and queer art has a lot of different messages. And I think it's important for us to remember that sometimes those messages can get diluted to give a everything's fine and we've all lived happily ever after kind of story. And that's very much not the case. So the images I've picked here are three um, really good examples of kind of why we need to remember struggles in order to celebrate where we've come. Uh, the image on the very right is of uh, 
a statue of Marsha P. Johnson, who is credited as being one of the instigators of the Stonewall riots and is credited as uh, one of the major figures of the LGBTQ plus rights movement in the US and of the trans rights movement globally. And what's really important about this statue is that when the Stonewall Inn was turned into a national park, um, they didn't have any commemorations of individuals and they certainly didn't have any commemorations of the trans individuals and the people of color who were there. So this was actually set up, uh, the statue was a guerrilla art piece. It was set up in the dead of the night by a queer artist who um, wanted to celebrate Marsha P. Johnson. Uh, and it stayed up ever since then, but it's, uh, if you go to the Stonewall Memorial Park, you'll see a noticeable difference between um, cis het tourists who completely don't know about the existence of the statue versus um, queer folks going to pay their respects. Uh, the poster in the middle is of the Netflix documentary Disclosure. I would recommend everyone go watch it. It traces the history of trans representation in Hollywood. And again, it's a really good reminder of the differences between basic representation versus good representation versus problematic representation. Um, and I think it's a really fantastic and powerful reminder of um, where we need to shut up and listen to people who are actually being impacted. And the final image, which is the one on the very left, um, local to Manchester, that is the Alan Turing Memorial in the Sackville Gardens. Um, lots of people have tried to kind of sanitize his legacy, um, but he had a very violent death. He had a, a very dishonorable discharge. He was a victim of conversion therapy, which is still legal in the UK as of today. Um, and I think it's a very powerful reminder of where we need to sit back and um, really engage with the struggles we've gone through. So <laughs> that was a whirlwind kind of whistle-stop tour across history. I've gone way over what I initially planned on, but um, I would love to open up for questions now. And I think there's one that's already come through, but if, if, you, um, if it would be okay to close the slide slideshow. Um, thank you. So I'm just going to take a quick look. Um, I believe there's been a question that's already come through. So I'll read it out first. How do you think that art will figure into the future of queer community? Will we move beyond the need for art to represent us and therefore advocate for us? I don't know. And I think it really depends on different contexts. Um, to, to give, to speak on this slightly personally, I am a Bangladeshi immigrant. Um, I work now at LGBT Foundation um, and it's, a really interesting experience for me as someone who comes from a country where it's illegal to be gay, to be working professionally in the LGBTQ plus charity sector in the country which historically made it illegal through colonialism in the first place. The reason I say that and the reason I share that personal anecdote is to kind of reflect on how messy queer lives can be, even lives such as myself, which I'm, you know, very fortunate and very grateful and quite celebratory, I think. Um, but I don't ever think that um, art will stop representing and, and advocating for us. I think what it will do is evolve to show different types of advocacy. So, um, you know, if you look through some of the images I shared in the earlier stages, um, uh, the pansy craze is actually a really great example where drag used to be legal or i should say um cross-dressing was argued to be illegal because it was considered immoral even though there's nothing actually wrong with it in the direct letter of the law and you see now where drag is pretty normal normalized you know you go to see really expensive drag shows in in many major cities around the world but that doesn't mean the drag still isn't political and it doesn't mean the drag still isn't advocating things. It's just the conversation of it has shifted. Um, so it's about understanding contexts and it's about understanding different ways in which um, community conversations evolve. 
Um, so that's um, that's that would be my response to that question. Um, so no more questions at the moment is the other uh, comment I've received. We do still have a bit of time. Um, so um, I, and, and I'm notorious for rambling if I'm given too much space. So please do send in questions. Um, I would love to, to speak more uh, and respond more. Um, I would I hope I'm not saying this in a, in a putting people in the spotlight, but um, also um, Karis and Pema, who I'm very grateful to for, for organizing this and inviting me. If either of you want to come on as well and have a chat, no pressure. Um, you're very welcome to. But um, thank you for, for, this, for this opportunity and having me on. This is that moment of strange and awkward silence that no one is ever comfortable with. So I, I do apologize if I'm being fidgety again. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I, so just just to um, just to clarify for folks, um, we are probably going to, to stop now unless there are any more questions to come through. Um, as a reminder, please do feel free to reach out. Uh, my email address is ibtsam.ahmed at lgbt.foundation. Um, I'd be very happy to continue this conversation. I'd be very, very happy to um, also have conversations around other aspects of LGBTQ plus history. Um, if I could just remind folks um, who are listening, LGBTQ um, rights aren't just for one month of the year. Um, History Month is a fantastic time to uplift voices and to celebrate what we've done. Um, and especially for the community, because we, we do still struggle through so much, it's a, fun, it's a really lovely time to reflect on how far we've come. Um, I would definitely encourage people to continue hosting these events throughout the year. Um, I think it's really important. Um, if there's anything that I would probably want to flag at the moment is please do keep an eye out and, and support the community. There are um, specific things that are happening at the moment that are quite dangerous and are quite um, uh, quite oppressive, particularly out, around trans and non-binary rights. So, you know, please have that compassion and listen to the community. Um, but, um, also, please do continue these conversations. We have had another question come through, um, which is, uh, what is your take on the appropriation of queer culture by cishet individuals? This is a very, very tricky one. Um, and I will, in fact, take this a step further and say that there are parts of the queer community that have also appropriated. Um, I, I will say, that um, you know, really um, kind of popular um, sayings in the community now. You know, the whole "yas queen," which you see in, in any queer nightclub. You know, orig originated with black communities. Um, originated with, um, in in many cases, with black trans communities. Um, in fact, you could even make an argument that um, a wing. Um, the um, kind of really bright eyeshadow with um, a cat's eye eyeliner is an, an appropriation from drag culture. So it is a very complex and ongoing conversation. My personal take on it, um, and this is you know around appropriation broadly, is it's really a case of listening 
to the community. I think a lot of times people try to make excuses on saying it's not appropriation, it's appreciation, or oh, I wasn't trying to come in and, and be disrespectful. But intent is irrelevant if the impact is harmful. I think the point it becomes particularly harmful is that many folks are still discriminated against for um, expressing what is our culture, what is our traditions. Um, you know, queer men can be made fun of for being effeminate, while straight men will be applauded for wearing nail polish because look how brave you are. Um, and in fact, you know, you take that a step further, um, cis women will be celebrated if they wear um, more rigid and masculine garments, um, cis men will be celebrated for wearing feminine garments, but um, trans men and trans women have to be um, hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine to be considered valid. So I guess the response there is listen to the communities, but also be very mindful of which specific part of the community you're listening to. Um, the challenges differ and the context differs, so be mindful of that. Um, and if you've made a mistake, put your hands up, apologize and change. Um, it's got a question come through. Any recommendations of queer art or literature that, that you are enjoying at the moment? I am currently um, on a queer literature reading binge. My uh, current favorite uh, writer is TJ Klune, who has done some hilarious YA um, and very wholesome queer romance books. Uh, I would always recommend them. Um, another recent book I've read, which was a lot more um, sobering, was the book um, The Outrage by William Hussey. Um, it does come with content notes and trigger warnings, so please be aware it deals with some very, very heavy issues. Um, but it's effectively a dystopia that imagines Britain um, under a fascist government and what that would do to LGBTQ plus rights. And it sounds far-fetched, but what he is building on is um, kind of the normalization of queerphobia and particularly the normalization of transphobia that we're seeing under a non-fascist government right now, but also reflecting on kind of the histories of things like Section 28 and criminalization and what would happen if those things came back. Um, so, um, th those have been some of my favorite books. I love reading comics. I I love um, Marvel's Young Avengers. Wiccan and Hulking are two of my favorite characters. If any, if there are any superhero fans, those would be the books I'd recommend. Um, and with literature, I just like going to local drag scenes. Um, I think something that RuPaul's Drag Race has done is made um, drag quite mainstream and accessible and fun. But what I always like to try and say with that is make sure you go and support local artists. Um, it's really great that artists who go on the shows are getting a chance to be celebrated globally, but bring that back, show that same love. If you're willing to spend a lot of money to go see someone because they've been on a TV show, spare some of that money to go see an independent artist locally. Um, and Manchester has an amazing drag scene, so definitely, definitely go do that and uh, enjoy that if you get the chance. Great, thank you very much. Um, you. If, yeah, if any more questions do come through, we can add them in for it's Sam to, to answer, but thank you very much for that really interesting and uh, engaging talk. Um, so yeah, I found it really interesting. I think a lot of people did watching as well, and it will remain on our Facebook page and YouTube channel so people can, uh, tune back in whenever they like as well. Um, and yeah, this is the the first in our return of alternative lecture series for this semester. So there'll be another one uh, in March, another one in April, but it was a really great way to kick this off. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for letting me ramble on about things I love rambling on about. <laughs> it's brilliant, thank you. I'll end the broadcast now. <laughs>